to start by asking uh, how many of you have used auto layout in some capacity before? You can raise your hand. Uh, very cool. So, you know, for, for those who haven't, um, it's actually really simple. Um, you basically just click one button and it just works, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's auto layout, right? I mean, there's nothing that can go wrong if you. <laughs> Um, I get a problem. Oh, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh -oh. okay, so maybe not so auto. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's great. Let's go ahead and start this talk by just stepping back for a second and talking about layout. Uh, first of all, this is not an introductory talk on auto layout, so uh, my apologies uh, if you uh, don't or aren't very familiar with auto layout. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow along. Um, but uh, for those of you who are, I think you'll definitely learn something today. But again, I'd like to start by just stepping back and, and talking a little bit about what is layout. So in your app, uh, on OS 10 or iOS, uh, you have a lot of views probably. Every one of those views needs four things specified in order for it to uh, have a, a fully specified layout. So one of those, of course, is the X position. We have the Y position. We have the width of the view and the height of the view. Now, Back in the day, uh, you probably wrote a lot of code that looks like this. Uh, well, you probably didn't write it in Swift, but uh, you probably did a lot of frame map. And you know, it looks very similar to this in Objective-C. Um, and this was you know, basically how you would do your layout. You'd calculate manually where the x and y position were and what the width and height of each view was. And you had these tools called you know, springs and struts or auto resizing mass to help out. Uh, but basically, it was you know, like this. Um, nowadays, with auto layout, though, I'd like to propose that you think of the views frame, which is again the same thing you saw on the previous slide, as an output that's calculated by the auto layout engine based on the constraints that you specify. Make sense? So the frame is just a simple output. Uh, it's not something that you work with directly. It's something that's going to come for free once the auto layout engine runs its magic. So with that, let's dive in. So living in an adaptive world, what in the world do I mean by that? Well, I'd like to throw up this slide and, and suggest uh, this is what I mean by living in an adaptive world. Right now, this is the world we live in as iOS developers. Maybe six months ago I would have made a joke and said this is like Android or something, but not anymore. Um, this slide captures uh, very nicely uh, basically the kind of state of the world as far as the number of devices that we are dealing with, as far as unique screen resolutions, even pixel densities, all sorts of things like that. Right. Uh, if you notice, this slide's actually only even showing the iPhone side of the world. It's not even showing the iPad. Uh, so it's actually even worse than this. But as you can see, there's a lot of complexity going on, right? Apple has introduced a number of new devices, not, uh, you know, including the iPhone 6 Plus, uh, and a whole bunch of different iPhones, of course, that we're supporting, including legacy devices, and there's a lot to do. Um, so pretty much, we have this state of the world that we need to deal with. You know, what are we to do about that? Well, Apple has officially said that, hey, here are some tools. Um, you know, as of iOS 8, you have these new size classes, right? You probably have seen these before. Um, we have two different size classes, really. There's a compact and a regular one. And there's also an unspecified option, but uh, that's effectively every view is eventually going to have the size classes specified, so it'll end up being compact or regular. And what are these size classes? Well, they're meant to represent a coarse measure of available space. So size classes are a coarse measure of available space, meaning there's one in each dimension. You have one in the width or the height or the horizontal and vertical dimensions of every view. And they uh, generally try to abstract away the specific size and just give you a rough feeling for how big something is at a very high level, right? So let's look at some examples. At the device level, here's an iPad in portrait and an iPad in landscape. You can see that they're both regular horizontally and regular vertically as far as the size classes go. So what does that really mean as a developer? How do you interpret this? Well, that's clearly Apple saying that they don't view an iPad in portrait or landscape as substantially different, meaning when you've rotated an iPad either orientation, you're supposed to kind of think of that as roughly the same amount of space. Nothing has changed dramatically. Now, let's take a look at an iPhone to contrast that with. This would be like a regular iPhone, like an iPhone 5 or something like that, iPhone 6 maybe. You can see uh, in portrait, uh, it has a regular vertical size class, meaning there's a fairly expansive amount of space that you have, um, and you can kind of see by the shape, of course. And you know, typically you'll have scrolling lists vertically and whatnot. However, horizontally, it's a compact size class. And that's supposed to indicate the fact that you don't have a lot of space horizontally. You're probably not going to want horizontal scrolling as a sort of UI metaphor or anything like that on an iPhone. 
Um, now, and you, if you go ahead and rotate an iPhone into landscape, you notice that it picks up compact compacts, meaning that both orient uh, sorry both um, dimensions are are constrained, right? They both all of a sudden aren't very expansive, and you can imagine it's you know and you can notice there's no symmetry here. It's not like when I rotate uh, the device, those uh, size passes swapped, right? Um, it's because you know Apple is effectively saying that an iPhone in landscape doesn't really have that much width normally. It's still not acceptable to really show a lot of content horizontally across, and that's why it's getting that compact horizontal size class. Uh, I know when this was first announced, a lot of people thought this might be a bug or something, uh, and how it's specified, uh, because this was announced with the iOS 8 APIs at WWDC this last year, and that was before the introduction of this device, which was the iPhone 6 Plus. Now, this is the thing that throws a wrench into all of your existing work. Um, <laughs> pretty much, right? Um, so what, what changed? Uh, well, if you look, the, in portrait, it's still the same as a regular iPhone. Uh, and by regular, I'm you know, referring to the iPhone 5 or 6. Uh, but in landscape, of course, it picks up that regular horizontal size class. Why did Apple do this? Well, you can just imagine they basically said, this device is now just large enough in width to warrant taking on a, a regular uh, environment for its horizontal size class, which suggests that you should treat it more like you would have traditionally treated an iPad. And that is exactly, of course, why you see an iPad-like UI when you rotate an iPhone 6 Plus to landscape uh, in many apps. Right? So this should be pretty straightforward, hopefully, a review for most of you. Let's talk about how you get size classes. Well, they come bundled up together. Of course, as we mentioned, there are two. There's a horizontal and a vertical one. They come in these trait collections. Right? Pretty simple. How do you get a trait collection? Well, these are vended by trait environments. And so what are trait environments? Well, we have screens, windows, view controllers, and views. Um, all of those are trait environments. So what does that mean? Well, that means any of them has its own size class collection, or trait collection, right? Um, and by the way, a trait collection includes a couple other things, but for the sake of this presentation, they're not really relevant, so I'm omitting them for the moment. Um, so we have these different trade environments. Let's talk a little bit more about how they're kind of organized. Uh, let's look at a typical app to start. So we have a, a UI screen, usually at the you know, one screen, kind of at the root level of your app that represents the screen on the device, of course. Uh, inside of that, you typically have one window uh, that all the app's content is organized into. Inside of that, you will typically have maybe a few view controllers. Um, you may have a parent view controller here. You can see the little darker shade with two child view controllers, for example. And then inside those view controllers, you have a number of UI views. Uh, you probably have more than that are illustrated up here. So generally, though, most apps tend to have this sort of a structure uh, on iOS. Now, what I want to point out here is that if we kind of explode this apart, all of these things are organized in a natural hierarchy. And this is really important. Um, this is something that Apple did mention at WWDC, but I don't think they really hammered this point home. And if there's one thing you take away, take away this point from this talk, please. Um, there's a natural hierarchy of how all these trade environments are organized. Meaning, traits are actually inherited through this hierarchy. So, a screen may specify device-level attributes, like device-level size classes. For example, an iPad, which is kind of what we're illustrating here, might have a regular, regular size class combination at the screen level. That window, if it doesn't specify its own overrides, it automatically inherits from the screen, right? That's pretty straightforward. So the window also would have a regular, regular. Going down into that parent view controller, same thing. It's, it's basically filling the entire window, uh, or its view is, and it's also going to inherit. Now, of course, when we get to this split here, you see we can have two children, two child view controllers, right? It's completely possible here that now the one on the left chooses to actually override what it's inheriting. Why would it do that? Because if you look at the shape, it all of a sudden looks more like what you would think of as a compact horizontal environment, right? It's something that looks more like an iPhone, in other words. Um, and so as a result, the left uh, child view controller may be overriding its inherited trait collection in order to specify that it and all of its children should, should think of themselves in a compact environment. Whereas the right side child view controller may continue to, to inherit that regular, regular combination because it didn't really lose enough of the screen. It's still taking up most of the overall screen space, right? And so forth all the way down. So it's really important to notice that even those leaf views, the ones at the very bottom of this slide, are still inheriting size classes. Meaning if you're programming in one of those views, 
you can actually look at those view size classes. You don't need to call back up to some view controller or something like that. Those size classes are always available on any of these trade environments. So, okay, that's a little overview of trade environments. How do we actually respond to changes in traits and trade collections and things like that? Well, there's a couple protocols here. Uh, one is UI trade environment. Uh, it specifies that everything ha every one of these you know, screens, windows, view controllers, and views has a trade collection, so that's the current one. And it also has a method, trade collection did change, and the previous trade collection gets passed into that. So you can obviously implement that method and override that, uh, or you can access the current trade collection uh, via that property there. Uh, so that's nice. Now there's another one called, uh, this is another protocol called UI content container. Um, this is implemented only by view controllers. Uh, but there's two really nice things in here. One is will transition to trade collection with transition coordinator. And the other is will transition to size with transition coordinator. So uh, the first one, of course, is called when the trade collection will change, basically, and allows you to respond to that. And I'm going to show you an example uh, shortly. Uh, and then the second one is will transition to size so that's uh, called any time that view controller's view is going to change its size. Uh, and a, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in the context of rotations in a moment. So, and by the way, uh, if you notice the asterisk at the bottom, UI presentation controller is also involved in some of this stuff, but it's less common, so I just omitted it for uh, clarity here. So let's talk a little bit about rotation, as I said. Um, first of all, let's start with an iPad. If you, these are the, uh, uh, you know, regular iPad that you might uh, know. Uh, 1024 by 768 you know, point resolution. Uh, when you go ahead and rotate it to landscape, on the left you can see the size, of course, changes, and it becomes 768 by 1024, right? It's, a, it's an invert. Uh, I think the, another important thing that, to call out here is that rotation, you shouldn't worry about the fact that there's actually any rotating going on. In other words, you don't need to worry about the fact that there may or may not be like a transform applied somewhere in the view hierarchy. As of iOS 8, Apple has straightened out all their stuff so that you can now just think of rotations as a change in size, which is exactly what you see on the left here, right? Um, now, as we mentioned before, iPad has the same size classes in either orientation, right? It's regular, regular. So you may not have a size class change in a rotation, and a change in orientation, right? But we could. Here's an example of the iPhone 6 Plus. You can see, again, there is a change in size, meaning the, the width and the height kind of swap. Uh, and the size classes now do change, because in portrait, it was regular compact. In um, landscape, it's compact regular. But again, don't think that these have to be symmetrical, as we've seen with you know, some of the other examples. They aren't always. So how do we handle these? Well, you're probably familiar with a number of these methods from you know, back in the day. They've been around for quite a while. Uh, the bad news is that as of iOS 8, they're all deprecated. <laughs> so uh, you had to come up with something new. You may have already had to deal with this if you've updated an app to link against the 8 SDK. Uh, if you have solved for these deprecations, you may not have been doing it the right way, so I'd like to show you the best way to do this. Those are gone. Here's how we'll handle rotation in iOS 8. First, you'll implement, you will transition to size with transition coordinator. Again, this is available on any view controller, uh, the same place that those previous deprecated methods were available. And uh, the first thing you'll note, you of course call super, and any code that you place right inside the implementation of that will execute before the rotation begins, and that's just like you put it in the deprecated method, will rotate to interface orientation duration. So that's nice and easy. Okay, now you might be wondering what the heck is with transition coordinator, what's this coordinator thing, how do I use that? Well, here's all you need to do. If you go ahead and take that coordinator and call a method on it, animate alongside transition completion, you have two different closures that you can pass to it, or blocks, if you're still in Objective-C world. Um, in the first one, you can place code in there to have any changes automatically animated. And the reason why is because that closure is run within the same animation context that happens, that is created for the actual rotation event, meaning, in English, um, any code that you place there gets the same animation duration, the same animation curve, all the same parameters that will go along with the rotation so that it will exactly match the rotation. Um, so this is really handy. This is something that wasn't even available to us with the old APIs. You would have to kind of infer the duration and, or you know, set up your own animation that kind of matched it and hope that Apple didn't change it too much or something, right? 
Uh, so that's that. Now what about that completion handler? Any code that you put in there, of course, runs when the animation finishes, which is exactly equivalent to putting it in the deprecated method did rotate from interface orientation. Make sense? And of course, anywhere in here, you can reference your current trait collection by just accessing that property. Uh, if you want to look at, let's say, your size classes and make a decision based on that. So, in the effort of migrating your old legacy code to this new iOS 8 world of adaptive UI, you may find this helpful. This is a, um, a small category that uh, we created in the process of migrating our own code that makes it really easy to transition legacy callbacks and everything to this new world. Um, there's a link to the GitHub gist, I'll go ahead and send that out afterwards, along with, of course, all the slides, uh, so you don't need to, to write it down right now. Uh, but, but basically, this allows you to actually check for any given view in your app what the orientation of that view is. Meaning, is it in a kind of portrait aspect ratio or a landscape aspect ratio? And this is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Uh, it's just a simple matter of comparing the width to the size and, and making decisions based on that. Um, so you might find this really helpful. Uh, and it, again, it's up on GitHub. So let's do a quick recap here. Making layout decisions. What are some good and bad things to do? Number one. Asking, what are my size classes? That is a great thing to do. You should definitely do that in order to make decisions about your layout. Another thing you can certainly ask is, what is my size? You know, if you need to make a more specific, a more fine-grained adjustment to your layout uh, that isn't captured in just the size classes, it's fine to look at your own view size. And of course, since an iPad and portrait and landscape have the same size classes, if you do need to differentiate between those two, you are going to want to look at your size, either by using that category I just showed you, uh, or by just directly you know, looking at the actual point size. What are things you don't want to do? Well, you don't want to really look at the status bar orientation. And this might have been where a lot of you went when you saw that those old APIs were deprecated and that this wasn't. Um, the reason that this isn't great is because the status bar is something that lives out, almost outside of your app. It's like a root level um, uh, view, right? It's, it's in fact, effectively its own window, it's like, it's way outside of the context of most of the views and controllers in your app. So if you're looking at the status bar to make layout decisions, you're all of a sudden tightly coupling views deep within your view hierarchy or controllers deep within your app, you're tightly coupling those to the top level property of the device effectively, right? That's usually not a good idea. That will lock your code in so that it can no longer make decisions on its own environment. It has to look kind of way outside of its uh, scope. For in other words. Uh, so you want to avoid looking at the status bar orientation unless you're doing code like in maybe the root window of your app, which does kind of live at that level. Um, you don't want to really look at the device or the screen size for the same reason, right? It's something that's not directly relevant to most of the content and views and code in your app. It's something that's very root level. Look, you know, use that hierarchy of information that's cascading this down. And finally, um, you don't want to ask what you know, traits or sizes do my ancestors have? And what do I mean by that? Well, you have any code that goes you know, self.superview.superview.superview.trait collection. That's probably that. Um, things like that, right? You don't want to have to have weak references to the third parent view controller of your child you know, to, to figure something out. So hopefully that helps you um, make some better decisions in this new adaptive world. And, and those decisions should hopefully scale uh, to any new devices that Apple might happen to announce later this year. Uh, so with that, let's talk just a quick uh, bit about uh, doing auto layout in Interface Builder. So we haven't even talked about auto layout yet. Um, so first of all, uh, you probably already played with this, but uh, if you're using Xcode 6 and you're working with the 8 SDK, you probably have seen this popover, which is your size class controls in Interface Builder. Uh, pretty much, uh, it's, it's just a matter of dragging to select the size classes that you want to make changes for, and then making those changes. And by default, uh, when you're in this any, any mode, that means any of your changes, of course, apply to any size classes, regardless of what they end up being when the device is run. Uh, there's no such thing as any as a size class. Uh, you'll never have a device that runs and gets an any size class. So it's really just a two by two combination of size classes, but this control lets you, of course, select multiple effectively. Um, so if you select more specific size classes, like you see here, you'll notice the bar at the bottom goes blue. That's to kind of indicate that you are now editing a specific combination of size classes. And changes that you make in your document, at least some changes, uh, will only apply to that specific combination of size classes. Meaning you can customize your layout for specific environments. Uh, you know, like you would normally have changed your UI 
be on an iPad to an iPhone. Um, uh, one thing to note here is that not everything, of course, is customizable by size. Um, there are a number of things. Let's take a look at some of the some of your options. So this is just one example of you go ahead and change a constraint and select it. This is auto layout constraint. Uh, you can see that uh, things that can be customized by size class end up having a little plus next to the uh, the property that you can uh, customize. So for example, you can see the constant is a property you can change, meaning the constant of any constraint can be changed depending on the combination of size classes involved. So here you can see we have in the any situation, uh, any any that is, uh, a constant of 10, but in the case at runtime we have a, a regular, regular environment, it's specified to be exactly 20 instead. Uh, all other combinations will be 10. Uh, and then down at the bottom you can see there's these checkboxes uh, for install. So we, here we've, we've uninstalled the constraint for a specific combination of size classes, and specifically anytime there's a compact horizontal or compact width size class, we're going to not install this constraint, meaning it's not going to take effect. Um, now, you may have seen this installed thing here. Um, you may have also seen <coughs> there the, this placeholder checkbox before. Uh, this was actually introduced in Xcode 5, so it's actually been around for a while. Uh, the installed is brand new as of uh, Xcode 6 in Interface Builder. Um, probably don't really know what the difference is between those two, or you haven't maybe thought about it. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and address that, because these are actually pretty powerful uh, checkboxes that you can use uh, when you're doing auto layout and interface building. So let's take a look at the difference between an uninstalled constraint and a placeholder constraint. Uninstalled being an unchecked installed checkbox, and a placeholder constraint being a checked placeholder checkbox. What are the uses? Well, an uninstalled constraint allows you to customize that constraint for specific size classes, like we saw, right? But it also can allow you to do easy runtime switching between constraints that you create an interface building. And we'll get down to a little bit more details on that in a second. Um, but con contrast that to a placeholder constraint, which is something that you use to silence compile time interface builder warnings. And what I mean by that is you've typically seen the layout checking the interface, the interface builder is doing on your auto layout constraints. Uh, if you have issues, which I'm sure everyone has issues, uh, I have issues, um, you'll typically see a you know, warning thing that comes up on the left panel, and you'll click that, and it's going to try to help you uh, figure out what might be wrong with your constraints so that you can fix them. Um, placeholder constraints can basically allow you to say, I know better, here's a constraint that I want to uh, install in order to shut up interface builder's layout lines. Um, uh, one, one example of that for, would be if you have, let's say, a view that has a, uh, let's say, some specific uh, content size that's specified only at runtime. So it has an intrinsic content size that interface builder doesn't know about because it's a compile time tool. But when you run your app, of course, there'll be some real content and all of a sudden that view can specify it. Uh, in an example like that, you can use a placeholder constraint to tell interface builder that, hey, this thing will get a runtime value for now, just ignore the fact that it actually looks like a problem. The other thing placeholder constraints can be used for, though, is uh, to prevent interface builders from injecting constraints to fix your ambiguous layouts. So what does this mean? Well, sometimes you may do, let's say, some of your constraints in interface builder, and you want to do some of your constraints in code, as one example. Or you just want to specify some number of constraints that isn't all of the ones that it's expecting you to specify. Well, interface builder is really helpful. And if it detects you have a problem and you build your app, it's going to help it help you and try to fix it. But it does that without telling you. And so what it does is it goes ahead, ahead and injects in these special prototyping constraints that fix your problems. But in reality, what's going to happen is you're going to run your app. You thought you knew better, so you were intentionally leaving these you know, problems in there. And all of a sudden, you're going to have a problem at runtime because interface builders added constraints that you didn't expect. So placeholder constraints can be used to prevent that from happening because if you put a placeholder constraint in, Interface Builder will not go ahead and run at runtime inject a replacement for it. So let's talk about the lifespan of these two. Uninstalled constraints exist at runtime. They're just inactive, meaning there's an active property on layout constraints. That's set to false or no. If they're not affecting your layout at runtime. Now, a placeholder constraint is something that never exists at runtime. It exists only in Interface Builder. So it's just a compile time thing that you're you know, using to tell Interface Builder or something about. What about outlets? 
Uninstalled constraints can be referenced via outlets. This is really important because if you go ahead and create a constraint interface builder now, that's that second bullet under uses. That means you can set it as uh, inactive or uninstalled, but then activate it at runtime without having to create it in code just by twiddling that property. Um, now contrast that to a placeholder constraint. If you try to create an outlet to a placeholder constraint, you actually don't get any warnings when you do that. It'll look like it worked. However, when you run your app, you'll get a crash. It's a runtime exception that gets thrown because placeholder constraints don't exist at runtime and therefore can't be referenced via an outlet. So this is really important. Um, you might get these confused and then you're gonna have a crash at runtime when that native or storyboard tries to load. So, Finally, layout checking, uninstalled constraints don't affect uh, interface builder layout checking, uh, but the placeholder constraints do. Of course, that's the point of placeholder constraints is to silence IB's layout checking. Uh, but uninstalled constraints are ignored by interface builder until they're installed, either for a specific size class or maybe never at the house. So hopefully that makes sense. This is one of those slides you probably want to reference later on when you actually run into this problem. Uh, but uh, hopefully it's really helpful because I have found any concise comparison of these two uh, since uh, install became an option for constraints. And this is one of the biggest <coughs> new additions in Interbase Builder uh, with S Xcode 6 that can be really helpful, uh, allowing you to create constraints and uh, manage them at runtime. So with that, let's talk about coding auto layout. Um, we have a few options. Uh, one of them is to use NS layout constraint directly. Uh, you may have done this. This is basically going bare to the metal. Uh, and you know, if you if you do this, it basically looks something like this. You go ahead and just create an S layout constraints by passing in a whole bunch of parameters, and uh, you basically pass in the views that you want to constrain, as well as uh, which attributes on them. So I want to, let's say, uh, pin the left edge of view one. Uh, I want to make it an inequality so it's greater than or equal to the right edge of view two, uh, and then you have a multiplier and a constant that allow you to, you know, of course, kind of specify the constraint. You can adjust the priority, and you can activate that constraint. So this is okay. Uh, a little bit tedious. That's just one constraint that we created there. Um, what other options do we have? Well, uh, Apple pr uh, provides this other option called VFL, it's Visual Format Language, and uh, this is basically you writing an ASCII string of stuff that at runtime will get parsed and hopefully translate into real constraints. So here's an example. Uh, we're actually making the exact same constraint here uh, from the previous slide. You can see you make this string that you pass into this uh, uh, constraints with visual format options metrics views uh, method. And um, from here, it basically again parses out the fact that you're declaring, you know, view one is view one, view two is view two. You can use keywords like spacing and priority and this metrics thing. Pass all that together, you hopefully get one or more constraints out, and then you can activate them. <clears throat> kind, of, uh, kind of tedious, again, uh, in some cases. Um, and if you notice, you're not actually getting any compile time checking on this because it's a string, right? This is that, everything you see that's red here is just a string. Uh, so it's not the greatest option, in my opinion, uh, but it does, it does work well for some stuff. Um, what other options do we have? Well, you may or may not know, uh, I'm the developer of something called Twitter Layout. And uh, this is a special API that I specifically created because I didn't like the first two. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> if you look here, uh, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, in this case, we're creating the exact same constraint, again, that those other two slides created. Um, we want to specify that it's a lower priority constraint, 750 priority. Uh, this one pins the uh, left edge of U1 to the right edge of U2 with a 10 point offset and it's an inequality so it's at least 10 points. Pretty readable. So uh, I would like to propose that this is a lot nicer to write than the, uh, the first two options. Um, so for those of you who aren't too familiar with Pure Layout, um, I kind of think of it as the missing API for Auto Layout. It's the one I wish Apple had built, but they didn't. Um, so I built it instead. And um, one thing to note here is it's a complete API for Auto Layout, meaning anything that you can do with any other Auto Layout SDK option, you can do with Pure Layout. So if you want to, you can write all of your auto layout code using it. Um, it is designed to be consistent with Apple's API stuff, uh, meaning it actually looks and reads somewhat like Coco stuff. Um, it also tries to balance uh, simplicity and power. So it tries to have uh, you know, real minimal third-party code, but still offer a lot of value, meaning try to help you <clears throat> write your auto layout code a lot 
It also supports uh, mixing and matching with other approaches, so it's not an all or nothing sort of thing, even though it can be. Uh, you can easily use it in combination with the visual format language or the NS Layout Constraint API or even Interface Builder for that matter. Uh, <clears throat> so it's uh, pretty flexible and it's fully compatible with Swift and Objective-C all the way back to iOS 6 and OS 10.7. Pretty awesome because those happen to be the first two releases where Auto Layout was actually introduced on the platform. So if you like Pure Layout, let's take a look at some uh, ways in which you can use it when writing adaptive layout code. So first, I'd like to start by uh, throwing this word out there, item coded. Um, I'd like to define this as uh, something that uh, produces the same results when executed once or many times. Okay? So let's take a look at a couple examples. Uh, here's a function uh, called abs that returns the absolute value of an integer. Uh, you can see the implementation there, it's pretty straightforward, You're probably familiar with this one. Uh, you can see if I call this with 5, it returns 5. If I call it again with 5, it still returns 5. If I call it with negative 5, it returns 5. Call it again with negative 5, again and again and again, it's still going to return 5. This is an item coding function. This one, purchase item, we might not consider item coding. When I call purchase item and I pass in an item, it goes ahead and charges my credit card for the price of that item. If I call that 10 times, it's going to probably charge me a lot more than if I just called that once. So, wouldn't consider this one item coded. Uh, one more example. This function is called empty cart. This one goes and removes all the items from my shopping cart every time I call it. When I call this once, it removes all the items and I have no items. When I call it again, it still has done the same thing. It removes all the items and I have no items in the shopping cart. So you can keep calling this all day long. It's still going to end up doing the same thing that it did the, the first time. So um, with that, how does that apply to layout code? Well. I'd like to propose that you write your layout code in an item coded fashion in order to help yourself reason about it and uh, produce better bug-free layout code. So let's walk through an example of how that would look. So first of all, we'll, t we'll have, let's say, two different layouts here. You have an, we'll have an enum, uh, layout A and layout B. And uh, we want to write a quick helper function that returns the current layout that we're in based on some state. So, you can see right here, it's called layout for current state. It's going to return one of those two enum options, either A or B. And the implementation is pretty simple in this case. We're going to look at the horizontal size class of this trait collection. And this is, let's say, in a view controller. So it will be this view controller trait collection. If it's compact, then we'll return A. If it's regular, or uh, unspecified for that matter, we'll just default to B. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, how do you actually go ahead and use that? Well. We're going to keep a couple of properties. Um, each of them stores the constraints that are required for that particular layout. So we have layout A constraints and layout B constraints. Again, just straightforward arrays of constraints. Um, we go ahead and override the update constraints method. Uh, in, um, oh, sorry, this might be in a, a UI view, which has update constraints. This is the best place to go ahead and write auto layout code. Uh, it is always guaranteed to be called at the right time in the layout lifecycle. Uh, and, and in fact, maybe called multiple times, which is something to keep in mind. Uh, but it, it's definitely the right place to go ahead and create and add constraints and, or activate constraints. So one thing to note that you do need to call super, and it, it's also important that you call that at the end of this method. Um, changes that you make inside of this method can actually invalidate the, the, the constraint layout, and you need to make sure the super implementation, which is the UI view implementation, uh, runs at the very end. So we go ahead and set that up like this inside. We're going to use that helper function you saw already uh, and figure out, okay, what's the current layout we're in? If it's A or B, we're going to do different things. So let's look at A. First of all, we're going to look and see, do we have any constraints in layout A constraints, in that property? If we do, that means that we've already set up the layout A and we're kind of in layout A. That's kind of the R invariant that we're specifying here. So if layout A constraints is nil, on the other hand, that means we haven't set up layout A and we need to go into it. We may or may not be in layout B, but that doesn't matter. We're going to deal with that next. So the next thing we do is look at layout B constraints and go ahead and remove them if there are any. Then set that to nil. So now we've stripped out any layout B constraints if they are there. If layout B constraints is nil because we've never been in layout B before, that's fine. Those will be no off. Finally, we can actually go install the constraints for layout A, which is that helper function, set up constraints for layout A. And then we go ahead and store the constraints that it actually creates into that property. Um, We'll go ahead and we'll look at an implementation of that in a second. But just for the moment, know that it does return all the constraints that are required for A. Uh, 
B is exact opposite, right? We check if the layout B constraints are already installed. If they're not, we want to go ahead and remove any that are from layout A, and then go ahead and set up layout B, right? Pretty straightforward. So let's take a look at uh, this line, uh, the one that goes and sets up the constraints for layout B. So we look at that function. Um, again, this is now using pure layout. So what do we do here? One, our goal is to return an array of the constraints that we actually created and installed as part of you know, activating this layout. So we're going to go ahead and use a new, a, a newer API that's a part of pure layout, uh, and it's called auto create constraints without installing. So that should hopefully it's kind of verbose. So it should hopefully explain what it's going to do. Um, but one thing you might not realize that it's going to do is automatically capture any constraints that I do create within that uh, within the scope of this closure and it's gonna automatically return those. So if we go ahead and create some constraints in there, you see we have three lines of code. These are calls to the pure layout API that each of them creates one or more constraints. Uh, so for example, the first and the third lines in there actually create three constraints each. So that's actually a total of seven constraints being created by the three lines of code. All seven of those constraints will actually be captured in the scope of that closure and returned. So if you're using pure layout, this is an awesome way to avoid having to keep calling uh, add objects, add objects, add objects from array uh, to capture these constraints and store them in one mutable array or something like that. You can just go ahead and uh, pass, uh, sorry, set up this, this scope via the closure and let all those constraints get captured into and return. Uh, and you can see here we're just storing them in a constraint, a local variable, right? Finally, it's just a simple matter of activating or installing all of those constraints right away and returning them, which is of course the goal of this function. So pretty straightforward, and you can see just these few lines of code would obviously be duplicated uh, in a sense to, to do whatever layout A needs to do, and then you're basically done. You've written item-potent layout code that when it runs, will actually guarantee to never recreate constraints, and duplicate constraints. It's always gonna put the layout into the right state and undo any other state that needs to. Uh, and as a result, I think you'll find that it's a lot easier to reason about the layout code this way because when I'm implementing, let's say, this function, I only have to think about layout B. I can already assume that all the layout A stuff has been stripped away and uh, removed out of the equation. So it can really help organize your code and you know you will have to write some complicated code sometimes uh, with a whole bunch of these all new devices that we're supporting. So um, on the note of modifying constraints, because that's somewhat what we're doing now, uh, I'd like to call out that um, if you change a constant of a constraint, that's actually something that's really efficient. Uh, what we were doing was actually removing existing constraints and installing new ones. That's less efficient. Um, it's sometimes necessary to do, so it's not something you need to avoid necessarily. However, if you can get away with keeping an existing constraint installed in, your, you know, in the auto layout engine, uh, meaning you don't need it to remove or deactivate it, and just modify that constant, you'll find that it'll be very efficient to make that change. Meaning, uh, you won't block the main thread, uh, won't have any performance problems. Uh, if you're removing it and reinstalling a ton of constraints, you may find performance issues to come up. Uh, that can especially happen when you start using auto layout and things like table views, which of course can be scrolled very quickly, which can cause a lot of new cells to be coming on screen, a lot of new views, and a lot of new layout work to be done. Uh, so, if possible, you wanna mess with the constants uh, only if you need to, because you want to actually remove and re-add constraints. Some other performance considerations. Activating optional constraints is actually more expensive than activating required priority constraints. Optional constraints are constraints that have a priority of 1 to 999. A required priority constraint is 1,000, right? Um, if you have these optional constraints, it actually requires the auto layout engine to do more work, because those constraints can be valid even when they're broken. Right? A required constraint, if you have a conflict, well, let's say another required constraint, you get an exception at runtime. And you've seen that, that was the beginning of this talk, right? Um, if that happens, the auto layout engine randomly just picks one of those two to break, you have no control over it, and then it tries to gracefully degrade. But at that point, you're in the territory of undefined behavior. You don't even know what your layout's gonna look like, because it's a random process which constraint is choosing to break. With optional constraints, though, they're meant to be broken, typically. Um, and so as a result, they can be more expensive to do the calculations for because they're not, the auto layout engine can't just check for one solution and if it doesn't work, discard that thing altogether. It has to keep resolving until it finds the best fit, right? So it's more of like an optimization problem, which is a lot more expensive. So another thing to keep in mind here is that activating multiple constraints at once can be more efficient than activating them one by one. It's not always, but it can be more efficient. So 
in the case where you do see performance problems, you may want to try creating all your constraints first without activating any of them, maybe using the API that you just saw me use, uh, that auto-create constraints without installing, and then you can activate them all in one shot. There's APIs on NS layout constraints to let you do that. Uh, that can really uh, sometimes uh, alleviate performance problems. I haven't done any benchmarking, so I can't tell you exactly what kind of gains you might see, but uh, if anyone does run into this and tries it out, please uh, let me know, and I'd be really interested to find out. So hopefully there's some tips to help you write better auto layout code. Let's talk a little bit about, back at a higher level, managing this complexity. So you've probably heard of composition. Uh, composition is a tool, uh, you, you know, Heard of inheritance that uh, you can use inheritance to help reuse and share code, right? You can also use composition to help reuse and share code. Um, I think composition is the right choice for layout code because the view hierarchy is structured in the same way. Um, table and collection views obviously actually kind of inherently are modeling this, right? Um, you have all these cells, and if a table view or collection view is composed of all these different cells. So you never are writing the layout code for a particular cell inside of the table, right? So they've kind of enforced that upon you know, developers. Um, but I would you know, posit that composition is the right choice for most layout code in general. Meaning, when possible, break your things into discrete black boxes or Lego pieces that you can then just pick them up independently without thinking about how they work internally and plug them together, right? As programmers, abstraction is our fundamental tool and this is one perfect way to leverage it. So let's look at a concrete example. This here is QuickBooks for iOS. This is the app that I work on in my day job. Um, it's really awesome. You can check it out in the App Store. It's a free app, so feel free to download it after the talk. But uh, what I'd like to just show here is one particular screen in the app. This is showing a invoice. So you know, it's an accounting app where you typically send invoices uh, from you know, business to uh, clients. And in this case here, we have a screen that shows you know, existing invoice that's already been drawn up. You can see this one's like an overdue invoice. And I'd like to call your attention to that red section. Uh, you'll see that on the right, I've uh, uh, come up one of, this is actually one of the members of my team who came up with an awesome illustration of all of the constraints that are currently behind the implementation of this view. So you'll see, first of all, just you know, net reaction is pretty complicated. Um, there's a lot of constraints going on. There are a lot of intricate interrelationships here. And you, you can kind of see all those red lines, of course, are constraints. There are a lot of inequalities. They're not all just, you know, connections, like rigid connections. Um, and the reason why there's so much going on here is because this thing is very dynamic, meaning we can have different content, like different localized strings, different values, like the amount, you know, could be a very large number, of course. We have different, um, th this same view that you see here is used for different types of transactions. We have estimates, sales receipts, deposits, bill payments, invoices, you know, uh, a whole bunch of things like that. And that, the same you know, view is reused, but that means a lot of the content can change. So even the button that you see that says receive payment, that can actually go away altogether. There are multiple custom user-defined fields that can be added. And so as a result, there's a lot of complexity dealing with these runtime changes that can happen. And that's where you see all these constraints and this is the current implementation. It looks a lot like this in the code. We've since realized over the course of building this, because of course this code has grown and grown and grown over time, uh, that this is getting too much to reason about. How could we try to use composition to help solve this problem better? Well, I'd like to throw up this. Uh, here you can see we've organized the same stuff into some of these shaded boxes, right? What those are are effectively just invisible container views, right? UI view subplot are not even straight, straight UI views. Uh, they don't appear in the layout or anything like that. But all of a sudden, they allow us to uh, kind of create these black boxes, right? These different parts of the uh, screen or, or this view that are interrelated, but in and of themselves don't need to be directly related to other parts of other black boxes. So once we've created these you know, different shaded regions like this, we can do the layout within one of those, which might be somewhat complicated. But then once you're stepping back kind of at the macro level, it's just a matter of organizing these black boxes relative to one another, right? So you can see here, the actual number of constraints went up from this slide, right? If you're counting, you can kind of just visually see it. But even though that's happened, because we can completely reason about those black boxes independently of what's inside of them, the complexity to the, the programmer, the developer, has gone way down. So this is a pretty cool example of 
using composition to make a somewhat complicated layout a little more manageable. Um, speaking about layout complications, uh, sometimes things go wrong. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about debugging auto layout problems. Uh, first of all, you have these system generated constraints that you need to be aware of. The first one is NS auto resizing mask layout constraint. Apple loves those long names. Um, these are constraints that are generated for views that are not using auto layout. Um, and what I mean by not using auto layout are views that aren't actually being set via constraints. Their, their layout is not specified via constraints. It's typically specified via the frame directly uh, or springs and struts, the auto resizing mask. Uh, for the, that case, uh, once you use auto layout for one view in your entire app, every view uses auto layout, even if you don't think so. Um, and the way that happens is that the system automatically generates constraints to translate the auto resizing mask in the frame into the auto layout in the world. Right? So if you run into conflicts where you see this class name in an exception or something like that, be aware that those aren't views or constraints that you have, um, there, there aren't constraints that you have created, they may be your views, uh, but they're, you may have forgotten to turn off that translates auto resizing mask into constraints flag, or you may be kind of running up against one of, let's say, Apple's views that internally Apple doesn't use auto layout for, and therefore you're trying to basically force it to be some size that it doesn't want to be. Uh, one example of this is the content view of a table view cell. The table view cell's height is specified by the row height, right? Most of you are probably familiar with that. Um, doesn't matter how much auto layout you do on the inside, unless you uh, correctly get that height set via self-sizing cells in iOS 8 or via manually you know, implementing height for row and index path, um, you aren't going to budge anything. <laughs> that table view cell is going to be its size. So if you see this constraint uh, in an exception, be aware that that might be what the problem is. Another constraint, this actually came up earlier, the NSID prototyping layout constraint. This is the constraint that it gets created by Interface Builder to fix your ambiguous layouts at runtime. So if you see this one, that probably means that you forgot to do something in Interface Builder, meaning you need to add some more constraints, so check your warnings or you forgot to add a placeholder constraint to stop Interface Builder from, from being smarter than you are, uh, because it's never smarter than you are. Um, another tool you have at your disposal are constraint identifiers. Here's an example of how you can use it. Uh, it's basically an arbitrary string, a description that you can apply to any constraint. It's a property available on NS layout constraints, so you just set it like this, it's super easy. Uh, and it is actually available back to iOS 7. Uh, even though it was exposed in iOS 8, it existed as a private API on 7, so you can use it even if your deployment target is back to 7. So this is pretty cool. Um, and by the way, the way this works is if you get a constraint exception where you know two required constraints are in conflict or something like that, these identifiers get printed out at runtime in the, the debugger conflict. Right? So you'll be able to see exactly what constraints are what as long as you've labeled them in a sensible manner. Um, you can also use an API like this, so this is using pure layout um, to create a constraint and then right away call auto-identify on it. It's do the exact same thing, the exact same thing that the first line um, you know, setting that property does. Uh, the only difference is that if you do it this way, you can actually uh, capture the return value of that auto-identify, uh, which is the constraint itself. In other words, this whole line of code, there's just one line of code here, um, can actually, or one statement, can actually be assigned into a variable if you want to store that constraint. Instead of having to write two lines like the first, uh, the first two on the slide. Um, finally, uh, there's another API here that Pure Layout adds that lets you specify a single identifier for the scope of any constraints created inside this closure. So this is really cool because there are actually six constraints being created inside that closure. All six of them will have this identifier set to that. So it can just reduce the amount of you know, times you're calling set set identifier, set identifier, or something like that. So that's nice. Uh, and again, these can be really helpful because even if you don't even write good identifiers, just having an identifier lets you know that it's constraint that you created versus constraints that the system created or something like that. Another option for view debugging is the runtime view inspector. This is new as of Xcode 6. Um, you access it by that uh, little button on the bottom toolbar that I have a red circle around. Click on that anytime your app is running. Uh, or paused, and you'll basically, it'll, it's like the reveal app that you may have used. Um, you can go and just immediately see all of your views in the entire view hierarchy of your app and play with them, and, and it does support constraints. So if you click this button here, you'll actually see constraints as these little blue lines showing up in your UI, and you can click on views, 
and click on even individual constraints to see more details in the right inspector pane. <coughs> so it could be very helpful uh, sometimes to see at runtime what constraints are affecting this view or something like that. Now, uh, one final option you have for debugging is the UIView.h UI constraint based layout debugging category. Uh, this is again Apple's API, so it's, it's available, it's been available in fact since iOS 6. Um, you just go straight in and can call these methods on any view. Uh, you have constraints affecting layout for access which lets you find a, you'll get a return of the array of constraints that actually affect the layout for the horizontal or vertical axis of a view. The reason this is important is because remember that constraints can affect a view's layout even if they aren't added to that specific view. Constraints can be added to any of the common super, any common super view of the two views that they constrain. So every constraint is typically relating one or two views. It can be added anywhere, oops, all the way up to the uh, window of the app even. Uh, and, and be working correctly. Uh, so if you're just checking the you know, view dot constraints, you're probably not going to see everything that actually matters. So you'd want to use this API, but it is debug only, so don't put this in code that you intend to ship to the App Store or anything like that. Uh, finally, there's two other APIs here. Of course, this is all documented in, in Apple's documentation, but uh, there's has ambiguous layout, which you can ask to see whether or not a view is under constrained, meaning doesn't have enough constraints to specify the x, y, width, and height. Um, it will be ambiguous if so. Or you can actually call exercise ambiguity in layout, which means that the layout engine will randomly pick another valid solution. So you'll see your view jump to some new set of you know, position or size, and that might help you understand what's wrong with what you forgot to constrain. So those kind of go hand in hand. So that's just a uh, quick tour of, of those tools. All these are just different tools you have available at your disposal to help you fix problems. Um, so with that, I'd like to, to just go into the last part of this talk. Uh, and talk about advanced auto layout. Uh, this is the fun stuff. So, uh, if you remember from the beginning, um, we started by just quickly reviewing the fact that the auto layout engine is a very nice calculator that spits out frames used effectively, right? We have the auto layout, auto, auto layout engine here. We go ahead and you know, put a bunch of constraints into it effectively, and magically out pop view frames, right? That's basically what, what happens. So what I'd like to propose is that we use it in a non-traditional way. We use off-screen views and constraints to calculate frames for on-screen views. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's kind of walk through an example of what a use case might be first. Of all. So I have this very simple app. Um, it's got three views that really matter here. Uh, we have a red view, a blue view, and a green view. Hopefully no one's colorblind, because I don't know if you can see those. Um, on the top left, so the green view is kind of positioned on top of the red view at this point in time, and blue view is just by itself on the bottom right. Um, we want to be able to do something like this. So with even the animation, we want to you know, be able to animate that green view kind of on top of the red one over to on top of the blue one. Um, turns out you can actually do this with auto layout. Not too bad. You basically just set up the constraints for the red view change them to the blue view, and then you call layout if needed in an animation block. And that animation comes for free. Um, it just will happen. Um, so that's cool. And we want to go back again. I mean, we can do that. But what if we wanted to do something like that? Like, have it stop, have the green view stop, like partially some random point in between those two you know, end states, right? That's something that you actually can't do without a layout, uh, with, not without hard coding every you know, individual position you intend to stop at. So uh, at least you can't do that with traditional auto layout uh, methods. So how can we use auto layout to do something like this? Uh, how could we even use auto layout to make this an interactive animation, meaning something driven by a gesture, like a pan gesture? Well, as I suggested earlier, we can use off-screen layout to do this. So what does that mean? What do I mean by off-screen layout? Well, off-screen layout is basically just Views that never get added into the main Windows view hierarchy, or the view hierarchy of your app for that matter, they're orphans. So at some point you have a view with no super view. It's just floating around in the heap of memory, right? Um, in this case, we need a few of them. So what we're, what we're basically going to do is replicate the current views on screen with copies off screen. Okay? So we have a single container view out on the outside. You can see that that's representing the view controller's view, which is kind of the dark, you know, black. Uh, of the simulator's screen there. Uh, 
And then we have the red view and the blue view, but they're off-screen counterparts. Now, these, remember, these are totally separate copies. They mean, you know, new views that are never being added into the Windows hierarchy. So we have those set up. We actually set those up with the same constraints as the ones that are on screen, because we want to mimic the exact same environment. The next thing we do is we put an off-screen copy or a version of the green view, and we add constraints so that it positions the way we want it on top of that red view, right? That's pretty straightforward. So now we actually have this whole little world of some constraints and subviews that are never, you know, they're basically just off screen, right? Uh, once we've done that, what we can do is ask the auto layout engine to do a manual and immediate layout pass. And what that means is it's gonna go and calculate the view frames for everything off screen. And when it does that, we can just capture the view frame for that green view. And we'll store that for later, okay? That's totally valid because We've just basically done a layout pass. Every view has a frame, and then we just store whatever that output was. Next, of course, we repeat that by positioning the, the green view with the appropriate constraints so that it goes where we want it to be, in this case, on top of that blue view. And again, force a layout pass and capture its frame. And so we've stored these two things. These are CG racks, just you know, regular frame, view frames, uh, just two different values, and we're storing them. And then it's a simple matter of not even using auto layout at all to interpolate between those two different start and end points. And this is something that is actually really simple. Um, so let's take a quick look at how this works. I have this code on GitHub. I'll just do a very quick walkthrough now, and I encourage you to all take a, a deeper dive into this um, after the talk and, and, uh, and see if you can um, find cool applications of this technique. But with that, thanks so much for your time, and uh, let's open up the questions. And we're gonna. Thank you. So, so as I mentioned, we, we are recording, uh, so if you don't mind speaking into the microphone, just put your hand up and we'll run a mic to you and ask a question. Thanks. So, um, you know, I'm all about, you know, traits sound really cool, but uh, what do I do about iOS 7? In terms of adaptive? So, yeah, I guess, I mean, so I, I still need to support rotation and stuff too, right? Yeah. Um, any, any specific gotchas you run across? Or? So we've had the privilege of dropping support for iOS 7 uh, in, in the crypto app that I work on on a daily basis. Uh, and that's been really nice because, as you can imagine, we don't have to deal with the legacy uh, you know, APIs and the new ones. Um, I would certainly recommend the, um, the little gist, that uh, view orientation, snippet of that category I put up earlier. Uh, take a look at that because I think if you look closely and really understand how you can use that, you'll see that will help you uh, avoid some of the deprecated APIs, but still apply them to the iOS 7 world. Uh, you'll see what I mean if you try to build a little uh, uh, you know, sample code with that, you'll, you'll see. But uh, overall, I would definitely say that uh, life is very difficult if you are intending to support 7 and 8. Um, one of the nice things I know is that if you're using storyboards or uh, nibs, uh, you can uh, have Interface Builder, they basically backported size class support um, to seven, right? So you may find that that helps, uh, you know, trying to do a lot of stuff with nibs and storyboards, because otherwise you will be either having to duplicate some code and uh, making sure you're handling the, you know, both sets of the APIs, right? Um, I guess uh, one other, <laughs> This is probably isn't very useful advice, but one thing I would say is make sure you actually look at the usage numbers of your app. Uh, for example, the reason why we aren't supporting iOS 7 is because we don't have very many people left using it. Uh, most people have adopted iOS 8 at this point, so uh, you know, try to push your product managers and whatnot. Be aggressive from an engineering standpoint if it's going to take a lot of work to update your app to support 7 and 8 at the same time. You may be able to just get away with supporting eight for new users, but of course, seven users can still download previous old versions of your app in the app store, right? So that's, yeah, hopefully a decent answer. <laughs> There's no real good news if you're trying to support both. Who has a mic? More questions? Oh, come on. Grill me. Uh, on iOS 8, auto layout support was added to UI table view, UI collection view. What's been your experience with that? Because in my experience, it's incredibly buggy and painful. Yeah, so good question. Um, I, there are so many things I could have talked about in the talk. I already cut a bunch of content out. And it's, I still think it's a long time. Uh, but auto layout in table views and collection views is definitely something that I didn't cover. Um, it is 
the, so the self-sizing cells is what you're referring to. They added that in, in iOS 8 SDK. Um, they, they do have an incredibly large number of critical, what I would call critical defects, like blocking defects that you can't easily work around. Um, some of those, I mean, you can see, I'm sure you ran into them. But there's examples of jumpiness on the scrolling. When you call reload data, like in a table view, you get put into a whole different position uh, on the table view. Um, there are a number of other bugs that we've been struggling with, and um, it's a shame that Apple hasn't uh, committed to fixing any of those yet. Is there any way to fix the jumpy scrolling, for example? Unfortunately, um, so I actually, if you go to my GitHub, you'll see there's a couple projects I have that are sample projects for using auto layout in table views. Uh, one with the iOS 8 self-sizing cells, one with the old iOS 7 way you can do it. Um, but if you look at my iOS 8 project, you'll see there's an open issue on there with some people discussing this. I don't have any solutions uh, or, or good workarounds. We've tried some things because uh, we're using some of them in, in our QuickBooks app too. Uh, and we have open radars filed with Apple, um, and we've actually, uh, Intuit has worked directly with the Apple developer relations, and uh, they basically said, yeah, these are like serious bugs, but they couldn't even convince the engineers to prioritize the fixes. Uh, this was at WWDC last year, so um, hope is lost. <laughs> uh, I don't know, hopefully with nine, I was nine this year, but sorry. <laughs> Question up here, uh, you have a mic? Yep. Feel free to put your hand up if you have a question so that we can run a mic to you. Here, right here. There you go. So in some cases, uh, I'm thinking of Bluetooth LE in particular. There's a very uh, formal specification of the data and its encoding. Yep. And so one can contemplate building a compiler for a data inspector that would take that source material specification and automatically generate uh, fairly complex inspectors for it that might be used as a starting point for design for now. Is that something reasonable to think about? Okay. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how, how that relates to the to auto layout, but let's talk afterwards. Uh, if you have more thoughts, talk about mine. Thanks. Questions? Anyone? Yes. Uh, is it possible to programmatically create the, like size class aware constraints like you can in IV? Like you should have I mean, a constant depending on what size class you're in. Can you do that programmatically, or do you just have to like listen for the yeah. uh, callbacks? Yeah. So, uh, so it's a good question. Um, it's to the best of my knowledge that when you do those customizations for constraints and other things in an interface builder file. Those aren't actually customizations that apply to the constraints themselves, for example. Those are, from my understanding, they're encoded into the views. Um, so the views, constraints don't have size classes, for example, right? They don't even know about them. So when the view, you know, let's say you customize one constraint for, you know, two different size class combinations, when the view changes between those two, it's going to know to change that constraint, you know, in an appropriate fashion. So, um, so basically, the answer is that if you want to do customizations like that, the best way to do it is just as similar to what you saw when I was going through the item code and layout example. You all you really need to do is override update constraints or update view constraints, and then um, you know basically look at the trait collection or whatever you're interested in. Trait collection, of course, if you want to look at size classes and uh, change what you need to in there, um, and the. the and so that's within update constraints. The way you can make sure that gets called when a size class changes or something like that is just by calling self dot set needs update constraints uh, on a view, and that will trigger update constraints to be called for that view whenever you call that. So it's just like there's a set needs layout flag, there's set needs update constraints that just will trigger. So you can call that multiple times, and then at the right time, the you know UI kit will go ahead and call update constraints to your view and tell it to update. So does that make sense? So, so basically, you can override a view will transition to trait collection or something like that. Call set a view dot set these update constraints, and then that view will get update constraints called, and you can make these changes that you want to. But it's just a simple matter of checking trait collection, and you know if this do that or switching on it or something. Further questions? Um, can you give some examples of apps? other than QuickBooks that do interesting things with layout, especially in terms of taking advantage of the six plus real estate? 
uh, so, so examples of apps that do what? Interesting things with so, layout, especially in terms of taking advantage of six plus real estate. Sure. Um, so I don't know if I have any off the top of my head. I know a lot of you know the popular apps that you'll that you see on the, the app store <coughs> top charts uh, have obviously updated for iOS eight, and then if you have a six plus, you'll see that they're supporting usually some uh, interesting UIs. Um, the one example I'll, I'll give is an app called Deliveries. Um, uh, it's a delivery status tracker. So let's say you order something from Amazon, you can put your tracking numbers into it. Um, the reason I pulled that one out is because for iOS 8, they went and updated their app. So, and I can show, by the way, anyone uh, after the, the talk. Uh, but uh, they updated their app so that um, when you run it on an iPhone 6 Plus in portrait, I'm oh, sorry, in landscape, when you rotate it, it, it shows kind of like an iPad UI with a split view controller, uh, right, master detail sort of thing. But uh, what's cool is that they, for this app, decided that even on an iPhone 6, they think there's enough real estate in landscape to display that same UI that would normally be reserved for a regular size class like iPhone 6 Plus or an iPad. And so even on an iPhone 6, they're actually overriding the trade collection, I'm assuming, and applying that same UI in landscape. So it's just kind of interesting because you know, they made the decision basically that they think the iPhone 6 warrants a regular size class based on the content that app shows. But other than that, I don't have any really awesome examples of like cool uh, layout in particular, but um, if you find anything, <laughs> you're good, sure. Thank you, Tyler. Okay.